important that we understand giving is a matter of the heart. Not your possessions. God is after your heart. I, I talked about last week, I dealt with how do we, the location, locating your affection. Uh, 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 hopefully it allowed us to be refocused, to get aligned with what Jesus has said in his ministry. Because the foundation of the last week was Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. That Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me daily. And I believe that what Jesus was doing was the fact that he was zeroing in on to get them to understand that if you're going to follow me, what is involved? If you're really going to be a disciple, what is actually involved with becoming a disciple? I think that sometimes that we view church as an activity and not a relationship. I think we view it as a place to, to, to gather instead of a place of worship. I think sometimes we view it differently instead of a place to have an encounter with the Spirit of God. It, it's wonderful because God has identified the church as a family. And he's the head of the family. And so therefore, when we come, we come with an expectation by saying, what do you have for me today? What am I to gain today, Lord? What, have you, what, are, you, what are your instructions that you're giving to me today? So, and understand that the fact that this, this morning, I'm going to go a great deal further. Instead of locating your affections, then I want to deal with the morning, this morning. What is the object of my affection? Because I believe that once you locate it, then you can find out, is the object really the object that it's supposed to be? Or there's another object that I place instead of Christ? Amen, go right there. So, so, so hopefully throughout this morning that we want to deal with that. Because sometimes we could, be, we could be, sometimes you may not be where you think you are. Sometimes your level of faith may not be at the level that you think that, that it's actually at. So it's one thing to locate it, number one. Number two is when you locate it, can it become the object? How do I, how do I realign some things in my life? I said last week that the word affection means this. It's a very powerful meaning. It's that affection means an, an, an influence that will produce a change. It means to move or to stir one's emotions. It means an emotional feeling of attachment to an idea or thing, watch this, that rises to the level that it impacts my behavior and my value. Just follow me along. That's okay. That's okay. It's a feeling of strong and constant regard for and a dedication to something. If there was something else about that word affection, it would actually show what you are attached to. We can each find out what you're attached to is when we pull it away from you. Your behavior will reveal what is of most important to you. Well, let me share some answers with you while, we, while we're on this road here. If we were to be honest enough that when we locate our affections, are we able to find out what is the object of it? Okay. Let me put it another way that years ago they say that we want to find out what is it that makes you tick. Who or what is sitting on the actual throne of your heart? I know sometimes in a setting like this and in another setting, you know, that Jesus is first. God is first. Jesus is first. Well, I understand that your mouth said it, but we're not sure that your heart located. So there's a difference between what you actually say sometimes and what it actually lived out in your living. So it actually then, so, so, so then how, how is it? What is the actual object of my affection. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 in verses 19 to 24 is where we're going to start it. But follow me along here as to get to that. I'm so amazed that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, uh, with Jesus came, watch this now, Jesus came to fulfill a kingdom agenda. That's number one. So a kingdom agenda given to him by God. Jesus makes this statement about the kingdom arrival in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. He expands influence of the kingdom by calling disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 21. 
Jesus began to fulfill the kingdom agenda in his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 to 25. Jesus references the points now. Then I believe that Jesus understood that as the number would increase, that he had to do something or do a teaching before they got on the wrong foot. I believe that Jesus had to teach on what we call the, the attitude, I call the attitudes to be, and, and sometimes we call it the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes. I believe it's extremely important that Jesus began to teach on them in Matthew chapter 5, in Matthew chapter 6, in Matthew chapter 7. If you would notice, Jesus did not do another miracle into Matthew chapter 8. Because during the growth of his ministry, he didn't want people to get the wrong impression or idea. So as, as his movement was growing, he said, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute now. There are certain things that need to be intact because if I don't put it intact, then we're going to grow with the wrong motives. Amen. We will grow thinking we're fulfilling God's agenda when it's really our own. So that how is it that he take this crowd that is growing, that is following him, that he got the, he's about to influence, and he begin to say, wait a minute now, let me deal with some attitudes to be. I'm of the opinion that, that Jesus go through three chapters here, and I think for these reasons here. He go to three chapters to correct our attitudes, number one. Number two, to align our focus with his. Number three, to correct our motives. Number four, to locate our affections. Number five, to reveal the object of our affections. And he did all of this before he performed another miracle. Because the next miracle he performed is in Matthew chapter 8. I begin to think about for a moment here how intelligent and smart God is. Because speedy growth sometimes breeds pride. Continual growth obtains the favor of God because you know he's the only one that can do it. So before they, those around him to get a wrong idea, slow up, slow up, come unto me. Let's go up on the mount and let me begin to teach you what, is really, be, uh, what really need to take place. So he began, to, he began to teach in those three chapters there. But I'm so blessed here because we find in the church today that there are other things that can be the object of our affection instead of God himself. Well, we'll find them out very I mean, it, it doesn't take long to, to locate those when we begin to talk about. So I want us to understand in Matthew chapter 6, and as we begin with verse 19 to verse 20, to verse 24, note what it says in the text here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon the earth, where moth and rust do it corrupt, or where thieves break through and steal. Notice what it didn't say. He didn't say you couldn't have a treasure. He didn't say that you couldn't have a treasure. But he says here where it should be compared to where it should not be. Now, now let's break down some meaning here that is extremely important here. Because it's it very important. Because Jesus challenges the location of their affection. He did not say that they cannot have a treasure. He did not say that. He, he was saying here... What realm that your treasure should exist in? Now, first of all, now, we know that a treasure, you only need a treasurer if there's a surplus. If you don't have a surplus, you don't need a treasure. Because everything going, coming in is going out. So you understand a treasure is based in some, a chest in those days to where they stored or kept for safekeeping, or even we may say in today's terminology, for a rainy day. And let me say this to every believer. Every believer should have a treasure. I'm talking about a physical money treasure now. We may start out, we may start out from, 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 from check to check or week to week, but it should grow and increase with discipline. 
Amen. Everything you want doesn't mean now. Are we good with that? Are we good? Okay, okay, let's go further. Now, now to think about what it says here, the word treasure upon the earth, what does it actually mean? It blessed me. It actually means this here. Let me see, treasure from the earth is what is birthed from earth. All right, watch it. Nothing that is birthed from earth will enter or endure eternity. All right, let's say it again. Let's say it again because it went like phew. treasures upon the earth are treasures that is birthed from earth, which cannot enter or endure eternity. So he's saying here, if that's your goal, then there are certain things that is subject to get it. Moth, rust, or thieves. Have you ever seen a hearse with a U-Haul? Earthly treasure is for earth. Period. Period. It won't enter in because God don't need it. Another part about it, you won't need it. What is taking my saving to a street paid with gold? Why take it a house when there's a mansion? So we understand here that, that, that he says, that, uh, don't allow yourself to be misaligned or out of focus that you accumulate everything here that has to stay here, but you have done anything for the reward is in heaven. I, I had a neighbor one time that, that, that you could not spend any length of time greatly with him without him talking about his money. You're going to know something about his money before you left him if you spend any time talking to him. Money going to come up. His wealth going to come up. What he has accomplished going to come up. Well, well, think about this. If he did that, his reward was in telling me as, as, as to impress me. It was never the fact that God actually gifted me, brother, to, that I could obtain with ideas and innovative thinking, and the Lord rewarded me. It wasn't any of that. Or God blessed me that I could give to every good work. It wasn't any of that. But one thing he did do now, out of all that now, one thing he did do with tithes. <laughs> Let me go further with this. He tied faithfully. And as he got older, he tied half of his tie to this church. He would call me at the end of every month or the first of the month. He would call me Walker. He would say, Walker, I got my check ready. Every month. Walker, I got my check. And, and he was a member of a large church downtown, but, but in the relationship and us serving them, being there for them, praying with them. And, 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 and at the end of his life journey, before he, before he passed away, he tells me, Walker, I want you to do my eulogy. So I'm in a place where old money is, and, and they don't know who I am, and I walk up and they find out who I am. They look at me straight. Why did he get him? And his family is still wonderful to us to this day. So he understood that if, if one principle that, that he understood, he said, Walker, I was taught to give from a boy, and I grew up in depression. I was taught it. I was taught it. I was taught it. So, so Jesus says here now, and, and, and listen now, he said, lay up not, say not, not, don't do, don't do for yourselves, church upon the earth, an extension of earth that is birthed from earth because it is not secured to endure eternity. But he says in verse 
verse 20. But lay up for yourself treasures, say treasures, in heaven. Watch this now. I want to say, say, say treasures that are an extension. Say it with me. Treasures that are an extension from heaven to fulfill God's agenda. Why else would God create money if he didn't have an agenda? And I know sometimes that we in church don't like to talk about money, but it's not a bad word. Say money. money. Say money. money. It's not a bad word. It's only a tool to trade for goods and services. That's all it is. That's all it is. See, something about money that, that, that certainly happened to money. But notice how Jesus covered uh, uh, several things. Because in those days, they meant I had paper money, but it had stuff that Russ could get to it and eat it up. They had some garments that, that if you didn't keep moth off of it, moth will. Thank you, thank you. Then it has stuff that's so much of value that some people just want to steal it. it. You know, I remember years ago, you know, my dad would tell me, my grandfather said, well, sometimes you got to rat hole it. You know, that means you hide some or save some somewhere and they should put it in the mattress. Well, what else love those cotton mattresses? Mice. Lord have mercy. Y'all never, okay then. I, I see, 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 y'all, y'all, Alec, you ain't never had one of those mattresses that some of you done had it for so long, got a little hole in it. You know what I mean? And sometimes little mice will get in it, you know what I mean? And nibble off your money. And so after that, Brother Eric, they start putting it in a snuff can. Or they would wrap it up and bury it. Amen. Now, now, sock wasn't good enough. Moth. <laughs> so we understand here, he was saying here, the type of treasure that we should be establishing in the building is those treasures that are in extension, extension from heaven to fulfill God's agenda. So you may think, why have you been gifted so much? Why have you been blessed so much? Why God give you innovative ideas? Why have God advanced you so well? Why have God opened up so many doors for you? Listen, it's not all about you. It's about God's agenda. I'm going to go ahead of myself and say this now. God's agenda is always about serving people. It is always about getting people saved. Okay, okay. There, here, here's the, I, I, I didn't have this in my notes. I didn't have it in my notes, but I, but I see that we probably need to turn to it real quick. So let me, let, let, uh, I'll turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Who is your Bible? Don't have it up there. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm going to look at verse 18. I read verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. It's not in the notes, so they meant they're not, probably not going to pull it up up there. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. It says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Then it says, For it is he that give thee power to get wealth. Did you get that? Who give you power to get wealth? Who give the innovative ideas? Who desire to bless and prosper you? So it says here, remember the Lord thy God, for it is he to give thee power to get wealth. Watch what reason? That he may establish his covenant, which he has sworn unto thy fathers as it is this day. Prospering you is a covenant right. He's not against you having a treasure. He's against the treasure having you. He's not against it. He's not against you having property. He's not against you having that nice bass boat and your truck is the same color. No, he's not against that. He's not against all the rods and reels that you have when you, when you can't fish but one at a time. That's a non-fisherman saying amen, amen. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's not against it. He just against it having you. 
And that's a good place to shout. I mean, when I understood that, that God has a desire that I prosper, he has a desire that I excel in all that is good. His concern is, is he still Lord? Or is it what I have possessed is Lord? He's concerned with, with everything that I have, does he still have access to it openly? Oh, man, now, I'm telling you now, because there are certain things you hold on too tight and say, God, no, 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 I can give that, but not, not this one, Lord. I just bought that one now. That's the, that's the hottest on the market now. That's the depth finder. That's the hummingbird, Lord, and, and that's got the GPS hooked up to it, Lord. I can see the fish in live and living color, Lord. and I just got these lures that just came out, and you want me to do what with them? I just said that about fish. It could be anything. It could be anything. It could be anything. It could be anything. It could be a pair of shoes. It, it, it could be anything. Does God... Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I used to think that people that didn't have much couldn't, couldn't have a spirit of greed. Greed is not based on the amount. It's based on the conditions of your heart. And sometimes people that don't have enough want to talk about those who do have enough. And if they owe them some of them, some of what they have when they were lazy with a little. No. If God say give it, we give it. And you give it joyfully. Because you notice now, God is not trying to get something from you. He's trying to get something. But if my heart is messed up, I think he's trying to take something. Every time God asks you to give, he's, there's a back door open as you give out the front. And one thing I had to learn from, from a testimony was this right here. You know, you know, I, I asked God one time, I said, I said Lord, Lord, I need this. And when I, when I voiced what I needed, what I needed was more than what I could, could, could actually get. So when I asked God for it, he took me on a journey. He said, I heard your prayer, but I got to take you through a journey that I could give it to you. Because if I give it to you now, you misuse it. But if I take you on a process of discipline, if I take you on a process of wisdom, if I take you on a process of just learning, so at the end of this lesson, there it is. But if I'm not willing to go through the process, he desires so there's a challenge in the location of our affection. Treasures from heaven are an extension of heaven to fulfill your calling and destiny. Only those, only those treasures that are protected. A treasure is a strong storing place for surplus. Then Jesus went to do in verse 21. Jesus said in verse 20. He says, uh, he, says he challenged the object of our affection. Notice what 21 says this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He did not say where your heart is, there's your treasure. It's the treasure that shows the location of the object of your affection. When I find out what you enjoy, I'm more like I find your treasure. What, that which you sacrifice for? That which nobody else can, 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 can mess with? That which is off limits to everybody else? That's probably your treasure. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And she looking at her husband, just laughing. Yeah, no, no don't, don't look back at her. Amen. Just rebuke it in Jesus' name. No, but, but, but know what it says here. He says very plainly here, for where your treasure is, whatever is the object of your affection reveals your treasure. So wherever that is, that's where your heart going to be. You locate your treasure by locating your heart. If Jesus is not the object of your affection, someone or something else is. Are we still good? Okay, I don't know if we're still good. We're still good. If it's not Jesus, that means something else has taken place that you are more loyal to than him. 
Okay, okay, okay. We'll say it this way. There's something else you are more disciplined to obtain than following him. Okay, okay, we'll put it another way. There's something else that has taken a place that controls your behavior other than him. Okay, okay. I don't know if I got him in more ways before you say amen. So, so, so if this affection shifts my behavior, and if it's not Jesus, then someone or something else is shifting my behavior. Because when you get down to what often say, when you get down to brass tacks and say, why do you do what you do? You begin to really get honest with yourself where your treasure is. Okay, now, okay, now, okay, we might, well, we might well move on with this because it ain't going to work. So, so what Jesus is saying here is simply this here. If we skip down to verse 33, it, 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 it lifts us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and the kingdom agenda and everything you need will be added. But seek ye first the kingdom agenda and everything above that, he will add. He's not against you having. He's against it having you. Are we good so far? So, so he locates, he challenged the object. Is our treasure Jesus? Is it Jesus? Or is it something else? Whose action is the object of my attraction? Well, well, well let's, let's, uh, there's another verse I had in mind that, that may be good to turn to. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. It's good to read this verse now. Matthew chapter 13. Look at verse 44 and verse 45. Okay. Give it a little time. She, 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 no, watch. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 44, Jesus is speaking. He's talking in parables. Know what he says? It says, again, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a what? Treasure. Where is it at? Hid in a field. Right? Then he says that the hidden field, the deed which when a man had found, when he found the treasure now, he hid it again. And for the joy thereof, he go and sells all that he had. Anybody feel? How oh, you didn't miss that? He finds a treasure that is worth everything that he has. It is so valuable that everything else that he has becomes insignificant. This treasure is the most precious treasure that you ever could find. So to get this treasure, he had to get rid of everything else. You follow me so far? Okay, you ain't following me. So, so the, to obtain this, he had to get rid of this. He couldn't bring this into this. So he got to make a decision in the balance. Do I want this or do I want the most precious treasure that there is? So it says when he finds it, for the joy, he hides it. He does not want anybody else to get his treasure. But what he does, he sacrifices. He sells everything that he has. He don't just get the treasure. He buys the field. See, he's saying here. Once the object of your affection is Christ, he is so valuable, he is so awesome that I refuse to hang on to my old life. I'm willing to give up hell just to get heaven. I'm willing to give up all the joys to obtain Christ. And to obtain Christ, I cannot take this into this relationship. So there's a field that it has for you that all the promises of God are yea and amen. 
He's dealing with the object of affection. So are we willing to give up what you presently have to get the main treasure? Well, well, that's not all. That's, that's, That's not all. Look at the next verse. Look at the next verse. Verse 45. Again, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Who went, he had found, he had found one pearl of great price. He went and sold all he had to get that one pearl. How important is Christ to you? There's an old song that says, I've given up all to my Savior so dear. How, what is worthy of you hanging on to that you feel you can't give up to have Jesus the object of your affection? No, no, no. He's after you. <laughs> he's, he's after you. Well, they want my money. No, he want you. No, no, he want you. Because if he has you, everything you own come with him. He want you because he gave Jesus to get you. You are so valuable that he gave the heaven's best. I don't mean it's a bad way to get earth worse. Now, you didn't understand that. He gave heaven's best to get earth worse. Because he can make earth worse his best. You see, 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 that's why when Bob said, Jesus, Jesus said, now, the one who has, one who has committed more, love me more. Because sometimes raised in church can be a plus and a negative at the same time. You think that you've been saved for so long that you got special privileges when you have none. All of us are saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. We have to come through the same canal. So he is saying here, what is the object of your affection? Now, say these things here, we'll finish next week. He deal with three things here. I want you to remember, you have to have a single treasure, which is Christ. We must have a single object of affection, which is Christ. We must have a single vision. And the third thing, we must have a single master. James said, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He goes on to say in Matthew chapter 6, if that I being single, single vision, who's the object that I'm after? Who's the object that I'm following? Who is it that is the Lord of my life? Single. Because the eye single, whole body is full of light. But if the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Then he deals with no man can serve two masters. Everything is single with God. It's not multiple. Either he's the Lord over what, I, what he has blessed me with, or he's not. Either you have access to it, or he doesn't. Do I obey God, or am I obeying my own self? I began to find out that, that every plan that I came up with by myself was earth birth. And he wasn't obligated to protect it. But every idea and strategy that came from him, he just needed me to believe. And he did the work. That's all. He needed me to believe. He did the work. When God gave the vision for where you're now sitting, over and beyond what we ever could imagine, but he went to work. <laughs> There's testimony after testimony to where he went to work. How you can imagine a, a handful of people begin to build something like this and, 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 no, and no bank want to trust you 
But then God began to bring stuff to you that, that you otherwise didn't know. How does someone walk up to a church and say, where's Pastor Walker? And I go out there to meet them and don't even know them. And they said, the Lord said to bring this to you here. Then another time, another woman comes and says, where is it? I want to see the pastor. I walk out and say, well, the Lord said to bring this here. Then there's a couple that comes to our church and visit our church and say, well, the Lord said to give y'all this. And even when we, since we've been here, someone walked through that side door and said, where is pastor at? I walk in and say, yes, man, this is, I'm Pastor Walker. Well, the Lord said give you. It, it, it was an extension of heaven that become God's responsibility to bring it to pass. So we can put all of our trust, dependency, reliance, and confidence in what is birthed from earth. He wants us to hear him to get what birthed from heaven. Because what's on God's heart is already protected, already blessed, already is an accomplished fact. He just need me to believe. So what's the challenge today? What's the object of your affection? What is that sits on the throne of your heart that calls you to change your behavior? Where is that filled with the hidden treasure? Uh, what's the pearl of great price that I'm willing to get rid of everything to get it. I'm willing to trade everything because the main prize is the person of Jesus and not a thing. And when that happens, obeying God becomes so much easier. Sharing becomes so much easier. If God were to withhold his oxygen, withhold his ideas, withhold his strategies, where would we be?